You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed. Finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Sarah works incredibly long hours in her shop, all about pies. Inspired by her aunt's passion for cooking, she thought leaving the world of employed work to create her own business would be the ticket to the life of her dreams. After all, what could be better than making pies all day and getting to share your creations with appreciative customers? Unfortunately, Sarah's dream didn't turn out the way she expected. Instead, she became a frazzled small business owner, weighed under by performing countless roles and resentful of the fact she can't spend all her time doing the things she loves. The situation is far from hopeless, though. Sarah meets business coach Michael E. Gerber, who consoles her and proceeds to instruct her in the art and science of running a small business. A series of conversations unfold as the two go back and forth, rediscovering the ethos of all about pies and implementing systems that mean the business can succeed without her constant presence. Gerber wants Sarah to work on her business, not in it. With the book's subtitle, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It, Gerber hints at the fact that so many new business owners get it wrong. A business should be so good that it's able to succeed without its founder. He rejects the idea of a charismatic, indispensable owner being the driving force behind a business's success. Rather, an enterprise only becomes great when it becomes a system. You must create something that, with a precise operations manual and thorough training to guide them, even an inexperienced employee could run smoothly. At the time the E-Myth Revisited was released, Gerber had been teaching this theory for almost a quarter of a century. With more than 25,000 small and emerging business owners as clients and over 2 million copies of the book sold, it's a theory that stood the test of time. For the purpose of this book insight, Gerber's philosophy can be partitioned into four distinct areas. First, we'll explore exactly what the e-myth is and how so many entrepreneurs are approaching their business incorrectly. Then, we'll move on to what Gerber feels has been one of the greatest advances since the Industrial Revolution, the turnkey revolution. Next, we'll go into the nuts and bolts of Gerber's philosophy, including his take on the life cycle of a business and creating a business franchise prototype. Finally, we'll explore the deeper significance of the E-Myth Revisited and how it opens up the exciting possibility for you to create your own world. Let's begin with defining what the E-Myth is. Gerber lists the stats on small business success, or rather failure. 40% will be out of business within the first year. Within five years, 80% will have failed. For those that survive this time period, only 20% of them then last beyond the next five years. He believes these unfavorable stats reveal a myth surrounding American business. Startups are not launched by entrepreneurs. Instead, they're launched by technicians. Here's Gerber talking on the Bigger Pockets podcast. Well, the e-myth is the entrepreneurial myth, and it's the primary cause that businesses fail. And so when you think about somebody going into business, instead of being an entrepreneur like everybody believes them to be, they're what I call technicians suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure. What does he mean by that? Gerber believes that inside every individual lies three types of business personality. First is the entrepreneur. This is the visionary, the dreamer who lives in the future and is the strategist behind any new business. He cites Henry Ford and Tom Watson of IBM as examples. Second is the manager. This person craves order and will do everything possible to maintain the status quo. They're wary of change and want to create a clearly structured and labeled working environment 
where nothing gets disturbed. Finally, there's the technician. This is the action taker of the business. They live in the present and are skilled at completing tasks. They have the technical knowledge, hence the name, to bake the pies or perform whatever skilled-based activity the business requires. All of these three personality types clash. The manager gets frustrated with the chaotic nature of the entrepreneur. The technician, although appreciative of the entrepreneur for finding the work, doesn't appreciate their constant demands and unrealistic deadlines. Technicians don't like managers either. Being individualists, they rebel against their work being restricted by a system. Having spent over 25 years working with clients, Gerber surmises that the typical small business owner is rarely a balance of these three archetypes. They're commonly 10% entrepreneur, 20% manager, and 70% technician. This leads them to fall victim to what he calls the e-myth. This is the fatal assumption that if you understand the technical work of a business, you understand a business that does technical work. You don't. There's a huge distinction between the work that goes on in a business and how it's run. He uses Sarah again to illustrate his point. Sarah opened her All About Pies shop on a wave of inspiration. She was enthusiastic in the first few months, but then hit a wall. She naively assumed that because she's a master pie maker, a technician, she'd know all there was about running a successful pie business. Many entrepreneurs might feel the same. You have a skill, whether that's writing, consulting, negotiating deals, teaching, inventing, engineering, or any number of marketable talents. You know you're good at what you do. In fact, so good that many people told you you should set up business for yourself. However, now that you're doing it, you're not getting the chance to share this talent with the world. Instead, you've walked into a quagmire of operational and financial troubles. Standing in your way are the numerous and frustrating jobs that must be completed. You must keep the books, clean the store, manage people, and market yourself to build an audience or attract customers. As a result, you feel like you're being pulled in 10 different directions and come to the conclusion that it's unfair. After all, you're the awesome writer or teacher or baker. Why should you fail because you're no good at doing something that isn't one of your natural talents? It's easy to feel sorry for yourself at this point, but you can't permit this type of thinking if you want your business to succeed. If you do, you could end up in a worse situation than when you were employed. In fact, Gerber wouldn't even describe you as being self-employed or as an entrepreneur. Instead, if your business depends on you and can't run itself, then you've just got yourself a new job with increased working hours and less benefits. Nobody wants to be in this situation. To avoid it, you must have a total change in mindset. You must be aware of the three business personality types coexisting within you and learn to listen to the appropriate one at the appropriate time. On a bigger scale, it's time to foment a revolution in your business. We'll take a break before we get there. For now, let's recap what we've covered. We're looking at the e-myth revisited by Michael Gerber. It's a successful and heavily practiced book on the do's and don'ts of a small business. This time around, we looked at the e-myth. If you're good at something, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll succeed on running a business doing that thing. If you're not running a business that runs without you, you're only working at a more difficult job. Next, we'll look at the turnkey revolution. Then, we'll break down the life cycle of a business. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. If you're starting up your own small business, the odds of you succeeding are terrifyingly small. According to small business guru Michael Gerber, you're most likely acting like a technician, 
not an entrepreneur. No technician ever ran a successful startup. This is the main conflict behind Gerber's small business literature, The E-Myth Revisited, why most small businesses don't work and what to do about it. Previously, we've defined the E-Myth and went over three business personalities. Now, we'll examine what Gerber considers the most major advance in business since the Industrial Revolution. Then we'll examine the life cycle of a business. In 1952, Ray Kroc walked into a hamburger restaurant in San Bernardino, California. As a milkshake mixer supplier, he'd visited many of the fast food restaurants up and down America. Most of them shared the same problem. They weren't very fast. However, this one was different. There was a system for everything. The beef patties had to be cooked for a precise amount of time. The workstations were positioned in such a way that the staff didn't get in each other's way, and each burger was created from a small assembly line. Even the amount of ketchup and mustard added was tightly measured. The result was a high-quality burger delivered in under 60 seconds. The beauty of the operation was that the McDonald's customer got the same experience every time. Kroc saw the potential for this formula to be spread across the land. This he did, eventually buying out the previous owners, the McDonald brothers, and opening new restaurants that operated on an identical basis. It didn't matter where you visited a McDonald's, you'd get the same level of service and quality meal. Gerber describes the McDonald's system as revolutionary and holds it up as the model that all small businesses should emulate. Statistics appear to validate this claim. While the discouraging percentage of failures amongst new business owners has been noted, owners of business franchises expect to enjoy a 95% success rate during their first year. Even after five years, three-quarters of these businesses are still operational. He's not talking about any old franchising here. Franchising has been around for over a hundred years, with companies like Coca-Cola and General Motors utilizing it to reach expanding markets. Specifically, what he's discussing is a business format franchise. The format is what's important, not the number of locations. Not a loose franchise model like car dealerships, but a tight system that can be easily replicated by anyone, yet still create uniformity of product and service. The business format franchise, Gerber says, is built on the belief that the true product of a business is not what it sells, but how it sells it. The true product of a business is the business itself. What Ray Kroc understood at McDonald's was that the hamburger wasn't his product. McDonald's was. There's more to selling than what you're selling. It's about how you make your customer feel. Do they leave the interaction with a feeling of satisfaction, excitement, or that they've been cared for? To ensure that they do, you must create an operating system that produces results 10 times out of 10. One of the greatest contradictions of the book, although not in a way that harms its message, is that Gerber, despite being a free spirit, is also a systems guy. There must be a fixed way of doing things for every part of your business, he says. This includes everything from the words your staff greet customers with when they walk in the store or over the phone, to the colors chosen for their uniforms and the work premises, to the way the product is created, and to the strict division of labor for all the tasks in the company. All this must be recorded in an operations manual that is easy to understand and replicate. This enables you to hand over the keys, hence the turnkey revolution, to your business to almost anyone and have them run it successfully. Gerber doesn't see a good system as being the enemy of creativity. Discipline provides freedom. By running a structured and regimented business, inefficiency doesn't rob you of the energy needed to innovate. And innovation is the source of sustainable business success. There are three stages in a business's life, infancy, adolescence, and maturity. Infancy is the start of the journey, where the founder is performing all the roles. At this stage, 
the owner and the business are virtually the same thing. Strategic work tends to be ignored. The owner is exclusively focused on making their product and the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Here's Gerber again on the Bigger Pockets podcast. So the cook starts a restaurant, the bookkeeper starts a bookkeeping business, the cardiologist starts a medical practice, each of them believing because they know how to do the work, they know how to create a business that does that work, and it's completely untrue. If successful, the business will grow and reach adolescence. At this point, it'll hire its first member of staff. In doing so, it'll also make its first mistake. Most new business owners are technicians and have a tendency to hire other technicians who can perform the work they are struggling with. For example, a technician who's proficient at making the product will hire a marketing technician who they hope will build the audience. The result, though, is often unexpected. Often the new employee will be left in charge of an entire section of the company and, as it grows, will have to perform roles far beyond their job description. Dissatisfaction increases to the point where the owner might unexpectedly lose this key member of staff through resignation. Now the owner's at a crossroads. Should they hire a new staff? Or do they decide adolescence is not worth the effort and return to running the business by themselves to infancy? The solution is to reach maturity. However, Gerber warns us against thinking that getting to this stage is a linear progression. Rather, maturity is an approach to business that must be adopted at your company's inception. From the outset, you must be asking the following questions. Where do I wish to be? When do I wish to be there? How much capital will that take? How many people? Doing what work? And how? What technology will be required? You must have a vision against which you measure your company. Adolescent companies can't do this. Everything is left to chance. However, if you do establish this vision, then there's a good chance you can make the adjustments necessary to realize it. But here's a tip. Don't just have that vision in your mind. Write it down. This clear vision may be the only thing that carries you forward to create a sustainable business through all the obstacles. The goal of the E-Myth Revisited is to help business owners build a franchise prototype. This transforms a business into a system and helps you work on it instead of in it. Gerber introduces a number of terms here. The franchise prototype is built through testing your assumptions. It arises out of the business development process, which is about innovation, quantification, and orchestration. When Gerber refers to innovation, he isn't just talking about creativity in product design, but how the business is run. For example, research done by his organization revealed that simply by changing the words you greet customers with, you can increase sales by 10 to 16%. Instead of approaching them with a typical, hi, may I help you? Try, hi, have you been in here before? This avoids the customary dismissal that the former greeting tends to attract and opens the door for an interaction. With the potential customer barrier now removed, they'll be more amenable to hearing about what you have to offer. Such simple business innovations can ultimately be worth a lot of money. Quantification involves taking note of the numbers involved with the innovations you introduce. This way, you know what's been effective and what can be ignored. There are no limits to the quantification process. Gerber recommends recording how many customers you see in person each day. How many of these are in the morning? How many in the afternoon? How many people call your business each day? How many ask for a price and how many purchase something? There are very few areas of your business that you can't quantify. The purpose of innovation and quantification is to reach the level of orchestration. This is about the mechanization of your business model. Your aim is to eliminate the possibility of choice when your business is operating. For example, you won't lose a sale because one of your employees decides to speak to a customer in an unscripted manner. Instead, everything is planned. 
everyone in your company knows what they're doing and, as a result, you're able to provide the same experience for your customers every time. Behind all the different stages and component parts of your business is the primary aim. This is the vision necessary to bring your business to life. If you can communicate the primary aim effectively with your employees, they'll go beyond the call of duty to help you realize your dreams. How do you discover your primary aim? Start by asking questions like, what do I value most? What kind of life do I want? Who do I wish to be? The answers will help you find your why, giving you the motivation needed to keep working toward your vision throughout all the trials that running a business can bring. Let's go on break one more time, but first, let's go over what we've covered. First, we discovered how a good business runs as a bulletproof system. You should be able to hand the keys to the company off to someone else and not worry about the entire thing collapsing. This is what Gerber calls the turnkey revolution. Then we covered that although it's easy to grow from an infant business to an adolescent one, it's a struggle to get your adolescent company into a mature one. Many companies fail or clumsily take a step back into infancy. Then we covered the groundwork for a prototype small business. We'll conclude our discussion on Gerber's The E-Myth Revisited next time. We'll look into how to create a world of your own. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our look into The E-Myth Revisited, an incredibly successful and influential book by Michael Gerber. Last time, we went over the importance of franchising and the life cycle of businesses. This time, we'll look into how to create a world of your own through Gerber's lessons. Finally, we'll look at the book's legacy. The E-Myth Revisited isn't just a business manual. Although the advice has been forged through years of practical testing carried out by Gerber's training organization, towards the end of the book, we discover its spiritual underpinning. To bring his ideas to life, Gerber intersperses his teachings with the story of Sarah. She's introduced to the entire E-Myth program and rescued from the brink of giving up on her business. Sarah rediscovers her purpose when Gerber probes into her past. She had a beloved aunt, with whom she spent many hours in the kitchen. At the time, Sarah thought she was learning how to make pies. But after Gerber's gentle questioning, Sarah realizes that her aunt was teaching her something much deeper. Here's Gerber explaining his process on the Bigger Pockets podcast. I aggravate people. I <laughs> aggravate them because they're unwilling to truly expand the way they see the world. So it's more than passion, it's dedication. My mentee's got to say, come hell or high water. Sarah's aunt wanted her to care. This theme ran through everything they did together from the way they meticulously prepped their pies to the pristine conditions maintained in their kitchen. After her conversation with Gerber, Sarah realizes this is what she wants her business to be about. Every customer who walks into All About Pies must know that they are cared for. It'll be reflected in the way the staff interact with them, the spotless appearance of the shop and eating area, and, of course, in the quality of the pies. Further on in their conversation, Sarah also talks about freeing her spirit. She and Gerber discuss, in a manner that won't be out of place in a healer's or hypnotherapist clinic, her riding on imaginary horses and experiencing magical journeys. At first glance, this doesn't seem congruent with the highly technical analysis of their prior discussions. However, Gerber's also a free spirit. Throughout his 20s and 30s, he lived a nomadic existence. First, he dropped out of college, then studied art, then became a soldier in the Korean War. 
he returned home to become a construction worker and an encyclopedia salesman. During these fluctuating career moves, he also got married and divorced twice, fathering children on both occasions. Gerber describes himself as purposeless. Something changed, though, after his brother-in-law suggested he come work as a sales consultant for his business. It was here that Gerber started formulating his ideas for helping small businesses. He became impassioned and realized it was a vocation, even a spiritual quest. Today, he tells people that the small business is a vehicle through which people can create new worlds. Conventional wisdom dictates that you start a business primarily for financial gain. Gerber thinks differently. What better way to leave your mark on the world than by running a business? This is because you set the rules. You get to decide how your staff treat the customers, how much care goes into the creation of your product, and the message your business spreads into its wider environment. You can even create a system that is so good it outlasts you. This is an intriguing thought for anyone who considers themselves an idealist. Starting a small business could be the opportunity you've been looking for to have a positive impact on the world. Perhaps you're passionate about health and fitness. However, you despise the way most gyms seem to only care about attracting new customers. As soon as you've signed up, it's as if you no longer exist. Facilities are allowed to deteriorate, and you're subject to a string of petty regulations as the management focuses all its attention on acquiring new customers. Rather than being frustrated by this experience, you should now view it as an opportunity. Perhaps you can set up your own gym. With total control over the organizational and people strategy, you get to determine how members are treated. Like Sarah and her ethos of caring, you might decide your gym is about making the member feel at home. As a result, people feel a part of something when they visit. Some even see it as an extension of their family. Don't underestimate the impact this can have. It might be the only thing keeping a person going during a difficult divorce or the loss of a loved one. Perhaps you've never looked at a small business in this way. However, what Gerber suggests actually makes sense. In this environment, in this microcosm, you can make things how you've always wanted them to be. You can create a world. How relevant is the e-myth revisited to today's business landscape? The original e-myth was published in 1986, and the revisited version came out in 2001. Gerber cites examples like Ray Kroc, Walt Disney, and Tom Watson. There's no mention of the internet, lifestyle business, or modern-day business heroes like Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg. Has the 21st century left Gerber's theories behind? At first glance, this might seem to be the case. The business format franchise appears to have little relevance to a 20- or 30-year-old looking to make a living from a podcast or a blog who prizes freedom and flexibility. There's no store to run and a very limited staff to organize. If they do need help, they can outsource and hire from a website offering these services. Is it really necessary for them to spend hours figuring out their organizational and management strategy? Moreover, many of today's lifestyle businesses succeed precisely because of the personality of the owner. If you remove them and try to replace them with a system, the personal touch would disappear, and subscribers would stop watching their YouTube videos or reading their blog. A system can't replace a personality. However, there are still many ways in which Gerber's theory is relevant. We're concluding our discussion into Michael Gerber's The E-Myth Revisited. Before we end, let's recap what we've learned. We covered why so many new businesses fail. They buy into the E-Myth, which is when a person who is good at one thing thinks they can create a business around their craft. Then we explained what the turnkey revolution is. Gerber believes that the best kind of business is the kind that you can pass off the keys to somebody else, and the whole thing would run just as smoothly. Next, we covered the journey from infant business to adolescence, then the struggle to bring the company into maturity. Finally, 
we ended with looking at how creating a business can be the way you express yourself to the world. You can create the world as you see it should be. Surprisingly, it's the spiritual aspect of the E-Myth Revisited that will strike a chord with today's audiences. Long before Simon Sinek encouraged business owners to discover their why and communicate it with their clients through the Golden Circle, Gerber was encouraging readers to discover their primary aim. These concepts are virtually one and the same, and Gerber's thoughts on the subject provide a good complement to more contemporary reading. And if you're creating a more traditional business, whether it's selling cupcakes, running a food truck, or opening a vinyl record store, the ideas in this book carry the same weight today as they ever did. There's a large part of the E-Myth Revisited that's timeless. If you're about to start a business, or if you've lost your way in an existing one, Gerber's idea could be a savior. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.